Well, today we're starting this brand new series. It's called Sent into the Danger. And for those who are brand new, uh, I want to welcome you. This is actually the second part, or think of it like the second act, um, of a longer series that's based on uh, one of the longer books in the New Testament. It's called the book of Acts. And um, Acts was written by a man named Luke. Uh, Luke is a close personal friend of the Apostle Paul. He's a follower of Jesus. He's a doctor by trade. But he's also just fascinated with the whole movement of Jesus. So he's done uh, kind of in-depth historical research of the life, uh, uh, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and then the birth of his movement that starts in Jerusalem with 120 believers and rapidly grows and then kind of spreads across the Roman Empire all the way to Rome over the next 30 years. And so he writes us a two-volume account of this, uh, this movement of Jesus. And as I've shared in the, in the first series, I often think of this as like volume one, volume two. It's like, uh, like season one, season two of a, a new, of a drama on TV that's designed. And like when you're watching season two of a drama, it, it kind of assumes you've watched season one's building on it. This one is very much like that. So in, uh, in, in the first, uh, first part of this series that we did last fall, which was called Sent uh, Life on Mission, uh, we watched as this, uh, you know, Jesus leaves planet Earth, returns to his father, and this movement of Jesus starts in Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit comes. Uh, these people are uh, radically transformed. Thousands of people come to Christ within months. It's going really rapidly, but there's also some storm clouds on the horizon. If you're here in the fall, you'll remember this, that there's some uh, persecution beginning to brew, uh, not so much against the people, but against a couple of the leaders. And today we're going to see an event as we launch into the second series, we're going to see the key event that's destined to change the whole direction of the movement of Jesus for all time, um, but also it's going to unleash a new wave of major persecution that's going to cause these 10, 15,000 believers in Jerusalem to suddenly, they, life's been good, they're suddenly going to have to leave and flee for their lives uh, by the end of this event. And so this, uh, this, this event that's going to kick it off, it's like a match to the flame, um, is, uh, involves a man named Stephen. And so if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open up to Acts chapter 6. If you have your, uh, your apps, let's go ahead and turn them on. It feels so good to say that. Uh, you know, this, we've been in this series on priorities, and for those of you who are new to Rocky Peak and just came since January, uh, we've been doing more of a topical series, and I love topical series because you can focus in on some really important topics, bring all the Bibles to say on that topic, and I love that. But, uh, but in those series, you typically jump around from passage to passage, and it just feels great for us to get back home. This is kind of what we normally do here and uh, unpack the word and say, what does it say to our lives today? And so there on your um, note sheets, a section called Stephen, Into the Danger. And so let's, let's talk about Stephen. Um, before we jump into the text, uh, you may remember this. If you were here, part of the, the last series, the last episode in the last series, the church dealt with a major problem, an internal problem, first major internal problem that had arisen in this rapidly growing thousands of members church in Jerusalem. And uh, the problem was is that the widows, the number of poor widows that needed to be supported by the church was kind of growing very fast, and the apostles were no longer able to oversee it. It was leading to some, con- some tension within the church. And so they, uh, the church selected seven leaders uh, that were highly respected to oversee this ministry so the apostles could focus on their primary task of teaching, preaching, and prayer. And so uh, one of the seven was Stephen. And so as we uh, open up today, um, our, I'm, I'm going to pick it up at 6.5. This was actually from the last series. And this is how Luke introduced Stephen. And this is something Luke often does. When Luke's about to introduce an, impo- uh, an important character to the storyline, he'll also often like, have him like a guest appearance, like a vignette, uh, a, couple, a couple episodes before. And this is what he does in the last episode of last season. Uh, 6.5, he says, this proposal you know, to create this leadership team to oversee the Widow's Fund, it pleased the whole group. And they chose, and he said, well, this is seven, uh, seven leaders, but the only one he really describes is Stephen, and that's because he's going to play an important part. He says, uh, they, they chose Stephen, a man full of what? Faith. Faith. So first thing, uh, Stephen is a full-on, passionate Christ follower. He's, he's come to Jesus. Uh, we'll see later that he is what we call a Hellenistic Jew. Um, that he is a, a Jew that's grown up outside of Israel. He's a Jew that has grown up in the greater cosmopolitan Roman Empire. Uh, so he speaks uh, Greek, probably his native language. He's going to be a little bit more liberal in his Judaism. Um, and he's come to Jesus, and he is passionate about Jesus. He's full of faith, 
And then Luke also says he's full of what else? Full of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, so here, this is a man that he's come to Jesus. And you know, that, you know when some people come to Jesus, how they just get like what I call a good dose? I mean, they just, they come in and they're just full on whatever you want. And they just open themselves up to God. I just fully trust you with my life and I'm whatever you want to do. And as a result, the Holy Spirit fills them because the Holy Spirit fills people who want to be filled. And uh, if we've got a lot of ourselves in there, Holy Spirit can't fill very much. But if we're saying, hey, God, whatever you want. And he was that kind of a guy, full-on follower of Jesus. And so what happens, he begins to grow rapidly in his life, right? And so when they come to choose men to lead this new ministry, they're like, hey, uh, Stephen would be great at that. He's full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. So he's one of the seven. So then we jump down to 6-8, because this is where our story starts today. So he's already introduced him now. He says, now, Stephen, he's a man full of God's grace and what? Power. So we're describing he's full of four things. Uh, he's full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit, full of grace, full of power. And what we're going to see today is we're going to see the development of a leader. You know, for your life and my life, we've talked about this many times this last couple of years, that God has a vision, right? That we, we come to Jesus, we're not just rescued from our past in order to be forgiven, we're rescued in order to be transformed, to be like Jesus, and then to join with him in his mission in reaching the world. He's got a plan for us, and each of us, there's a calling on our life. Each of us are gifts. But in order to discover that gift and that calling and that destiny, it's like there's choices that we make along the line. There's a process we go through. And this is what we're going to see in Stephen, that he starts off just passionate Christ follower. I just want whatever Jesus has. I'm trusting him, full of the Holy Spirit. And then as a result of that, people recognize, man, this guy is an awesome guy. He would make a great leader of the food ministry, so they choose him to that. But the next step is... Stephen's going to, you're going to see, it's like he wants more, that God is doing more in his life. And so next we're going to see him moving into a teaching and preaching role. And he's actually going to begin sharing Christ at some of the local synagogues in the area and making the defense that Jesus is the Messiah. And he's also going to begin experiencing some miraculous powers in his life, some, some healing gifts, which is kind of cool because up to this point in the story, only apostles have healed anyone. But uh, they've laid their hands on these seven, and whether that's why this change, we don't know. But he's the first guy that's not an apostle that's actually going to be performing healings and miracles. And so we're going to watch his growth today in this transition as God brings him from being a non-believer to bringing him full on to his purpose in life. And we'll see next week coming to his full, complete purpose of carrying out his destiny. And so anyway, so Stephen, uh, verse 8, he's full of God's grace and power, and he's performing these great wonders and signs among the people. We're assuming that's probably healings. And uh, <laughs> as he does, this opposition arises from members of a particular synagogue. Uh, there's many in Jerusalem, and it was called the Synagogue of the Freedmen. Now, the reason it was called Synagogue of the Freedmen is because the, all the people who attended that synagogue were slave, had been slaves that had been emancipated. So these were people that had grown up outside the Roman Empire, as we'll learn in just a second, or outside of Jerusalem, rather, in the Roman Empire. They had been slaves one way or another, bought or been free, uh, freed. They'd, they'd been emancipated. So they and their sons and their families now have the synagogue of the freedmen in Jerusalem. And he says, here's where they were uh, from. He says they're Jews from Cyrene, which is North Africa, Libya. Um, uh, it's a city there. Uh, Alexandria, which is the second largest city in the Roman Empire. That's in Egypt. Uh, and then also from the provinces in the north, um, this would be like modern-day Turkey, Cilicia, and Asia, uh, and they began to argue with Stephen. So you have a picture of this. So Stephen, he's just feeling compelled to share the message of Jesus, and he feels like he has some teaching gifts. So he's going into synagogues, and he's beginning to make a case that the prophecies in the Old Testament are then fulfilled by Jesus. He is the Messiah. And this is bringing him into debate with them and argument. But an interesting thing happens, it says, Verse 10, but they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. That as he's sharing Jesus, and maybe you've experienced this, whereas you've been sharing Jesus with someone, that sometimes you have words to say, like, I don't know where that came from, you know? <laughs> like, that was just really, that was brilliant, you know? And I don't think it was me. Uh, but uh, this is something Jesus had promised. Jesus promised that uh, as his followers that we will face opposition. As we share Jesus, the people will push back. There'll be persecution. But he said, hey, when that happens, don't worry. I'll be with you in the midst of it, and I'll give you what to say. In fact, there in your note sheet, I put this verse from Luke chapter uh, 21. Remember, Luke is volume one, right, of, of this story. And so, you know, uh, Luke assumes we're familiar with this. We've just read it. 
So in Luke 21, Jesus said, hey, this, he's talking to his apostles. He said, they're going to lay hands on you, and they're going to um, persecute you. It's going to happen. And they're going to deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. Uh, and this will result in your being witnesses to them. This is great. I'm in this thing. I, you know, I'm going to put you in the danger zone, and it's going to be awesome because you're going to be able to share about me. And he says, um, but don't, you know, to make up your mind not to worry beforehand about how you'll defend yourself, because I'll give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. So Jesus had predicted this, and we saw in Peter and Steve, uh, Peter and, and John back in chapter three and four and five. Remember, they're standing before the Sanhedrin, the same group that had just shortly before executed Jesus. Uh, they're just so bold and confident, and they're like, man, who are these guys? Oh, they, they were with Jesus. It's like, they're just like Jesus people, you know? Like, we thought we got rid of him. And so we've seen this before. Now we're seeing it again in Stephen. Okay, so Stephen sharing, giving incredible wisdom. And since they can't, uh, and since they can't beat Stephen the old-fashioned way, uh, legitimately, they're going to do it like we always do. We cheat. And so they are going to, like, they're going to go to the, they're going to try to get some false witnesses to accuse him of things that will be, uh, he could be convicted of for blasphemy. Now, blasphemy in the Jewish world is a high crime. It is, um, it's considered punishable by death in the Old Testament. Um, Jesus was executed for blasphemy. And you may remember in the trial of Jesus, which you remember it happened not that long before this. We're not sure exactly, but maybe nine months, 12 months, 18 months, probably within a year, 18 months. The same, uh, this, when Jesus was brought forward, remember they brought false witnesses forward to try to find charges that they could accuse him of. And that they couldn't, but he eventually, uh, he eventually said things that they said were blasphemous. And that was the thing. So this is their strategy. Let's go get some guys. Let's uh, acute, make some accusations. Let's see if we can hang him out to dry. Let's see if we can bring him up on charges of blasphemy so we can kill him. That's the, that's the thought. Now, it's interesting because we're going to see this all the way through this week and next. The trial of Jesus and the trial of Stephen are like really similar. It's uncannily similar, like supernaturally like similar. Um, like Jesus would be brought up. One of the accusations made against Jesus was that he said that he would destroy the temple and three days rebuild it. Well, he did say that the temple, he said, what he said is if you destroy this temple, referring to his body, uh, I will re restore it. It's a prophecy of his death and resurrection. Um, Jesus did say that the temple would be destroyed. The days of the temple are coming to an end. He did not say he would destroy it. And these were the, they tried to bring him up on those false charges, didn't stick, but they're going to use a similar approach with Stephen. And so in, in verse 12, it says, they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. Now catch this, this is a new thing. Prior to Stephen's arrest, the movement of Jesus has been very popular in Jerusalem. Um, not that everyone's joined. I mean, Jerusalem's a big city, and they're probably only a church of 10 and 15,000. But, um, but it's very popular. In fact, uh, earlier in Acts, Luke said that all the people spoke well of it. So up to this point, there's been some persecution, but it's been by the leaders against the leaders, leaders of, against the leaders of the movement of Jesus. The, it's been a very popular uh, movement. And that's about to change. And here's why. We're kind of reading between the lines, but we'll, be doing, we'll see this this week and next week. Is that Stephen seems to understand that with the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, things are changing. The role that the temple plays in the life of a believer is going to change. The role the law of Moses plays in the life of a believer is about to change. Now catch this. If you're a Jew at the time, living in Jerusalem at the time of Stephen, it's one thing to say you believe Jesus is the Messiah. We can live with that. It's another thing to mess with the temple or the law. Because for the Jews of Jesus' day, that's what makes Judaism what it is. The law of Moses and the temple, the place where God dwells, these are like holy things. You don't mess with that. You mess with the temple you mess with the law, you're messing with God, and you're going down. And it's almost like these, the, 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 in the early movement of Jesus and the first, the first Jews in the area, they didn't realize all the implications that were going to happen 
all the changes were going to come. It's interesting, at this point, and this is fascinating to me, the apostles don't even realize it. We'll talk about that more later. Stephen, being a Greek Hellenistic Jew out from cosmopolitan world, he's got a different worldview. And as he's teaching through the Old Testament and making the case about Jesus, I think it's beginning to dawn on him. Times are changing. And so the accusations they're going to bring against him are false, that he's going to tear down this. And gonna, that's going to be false. But I think they're on to something, that he realizes times are changing, and they see this as a, a huge threat to their, their kind of view of how life works. And so the people, when they begin to get wind of this, they get incited as well. Right? And so in verse 12, they stir up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law, and so they see Stephen, they bring him before the Sanhedrin. Remember, the same high court, it's kind of a combination of our Senate, United States Senate, and slash Supreme Court in one. Uh, it's made up of 71 members. It's the uh, highest judicial uh, legislative body of the nation, led by the high priest. And so, so they bring him before them, and it's the same group that had executed Jesus shortly before. It's the same group that arrested Peter and John, had them beaten, and so on. And so in verse 13, um, they, uh, they produced false witnesses, and they said, this fellow never stops speaking against this holy place, the temple, and against the law, for we've heard him say that Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place. And he hadn't said that, but he'd said things that could be taken that way. Uh, and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. Okay, and so, uh, so, so these are the charges. These are the formal charges, and picture this, big rotunda, marble lined, you know, high class place, beautiful place, 71 of his, uh, the Senate kind of judicial judges around, he's at the center, um, and they are, these are serious charges, these are men who have tried to stop the movement of Jesus, these are men who have had Peter and John whipped brutally to stop the movement, it is not stopping, it is growing, and now you have another guy coming up making very serious charges against the law and against what Jesus is going to do and how it's going to change the nation, and they see it as a threat. And so you can sense the tension in the room. And, uh, and yet the funny thing is, here's Stephen, he's the only one at peace. And it says at verse 15, all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at, at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. And this is one of those times where I really want to pull Luke aside and say, it would be really helpful if from time to time you just drop a little footnote in, <laughs> like what you're talking about, you know, because I don't really know, are we talking precious moments here? You know, like, uh, are we talking like, well, it's face of an angel. And here's what we think, theological, what biblical, what we think's going on, we're not sure, but you know, when Moses went up to receive the law of God, and this whole trial is with the law of God of Moses, right? That when he went up there, we're told that when he came back from Mount Sinai, do you remember this, that his face was glowing from the presence of God, like, a, like an angel? And uh, there are many scholars who believe that Luke is kind of giving us a tip, but there's something supernatural going on here. Uh, and Stephen's, even in his countenance, it's almost like God is bearing witness that as Moses came down with the law, here's uh, another of my messengers coming down with another, kind of the next stage of this journey. But we don't know that for sure. But anyway, so, so, so now the stage is set, right? You, you, can see, you can see the room. You can see him. You understand the charges. You understand why they're upset. You, you can feel the hostility in the room. Same group that executed Jesus. And the question is, what's going to happen? And what's going to happen next is Stephen is going to be now given permission to give his defense. And uh, that's what's going to happen now. But we're going to stop it right here because uh, that's, that's a long defense. We're going to come back, cover that next week. But what I want to do today is we launch this series is I want to highlight three foundational principles that are going to carry, they say three, it's really two. It was originally three because of time, uh, it's two, and it's still too long. But, uh, okay, I know what I'm saying now. There's two main points and three under one. Um, uh, here's what we're going to do. I mean, we're going to highlight a couple principles um, that are going to carry us through this whole series. Um, that we're going to see flowing out of this passage. We're going to see more of this all through this series. And these, three, these, these principles are critical, really, for us to understand what it means to be a follower of Jesus, especially in these times. And this is day and age, right? So there in your note sheet, you have a section that's called 
life on mission, into the danger, and let's jump in. Now, the first principle I'm going to spend a long time on, we'll break it down, three subset principles, uh, and then we'll come back. The second one will go very rapidly, but uh, here we go. Number one, the first thing we're going to learn in this series is that if you live on mission, you will enter the danger. If you live on mission, you will enter the danger. <coughs> now, you say, what do you mean? Well, let's step back. Um, and let's, let's kind of go back to the first series because this series is going to build very much on the first series. In the first series, which was called Sent, Life on Mission, one of the things, the very first week I told you is that the book of Acts, the movement of Jesus, the church of Jesus is missional. I don't know if you remember that term. I said Acts is missional. And um, you say, what do you mean? Well, uh, what I mean is that uh, when Jesus came, he was a man on a mission, that he came to rescue a lost world as the first step in rescuing and recreating all of creation, new heavens, new earth with a new population, right, that we talk about all the time here. Um, and so Jesus was a man on a mission. He came to seek and save that which was lost. So when he left, he transferred this mission to his followers and turned this mission over to you. So, for example, in John 17, which is the last night that Jesus was with his men before he was arrested, he was praying, and I put this on your note sheet, second verse down. He's praying, and he says, Father, I'm coming to you now. I'm, I'm, I'm returning home. He says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world. I'm not praying, you know, you just kind of like go live in a monastery someplace, right? But that you protect them from the evil one. Like, I'm, I'm sending them into a danger zone. I just want to protect them in the midst of it. And he says, then he says this, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. Okay? As you've sent me, I'm sending them. It's where this whole series on the book of Acts takes its title from, sent. And what we find out is that when a man or woman comes to Jesus, we talk about this all the time, but when a man or woman comes to Jesus, we are not saved just so that we can be forgiven and go to heaven when we die. We are saved so that we can be transformed to become like Jesus and become world changers. Like we are saved so we can be changed and join Jesus in his mission of extending his kingdom wherever we go and sharing the good news of the king that's come and that there's an offer for anyone who wants it of total amnesty for all crimes committed against the king that we can come home, be restored, remade, be part of this new kingdom that's coming. Right? So when you come to Jesus, we're not just chosen to be forgiven, we're chosen to be empowered for mission. And we are uniquely equipped for mission. And every one of us in this room, there's a part, there's, a, there's an important part for us to play in this mission of Jesus. And so in Acts, the first series in Acts, we talked about this is what it means to live life on mission. What does it look like to be filled with his spirit? to be learning to listen to his voice, to exercise our gifts, to be, make a difference in the world, to live life on mission. We talked about that. So the second series is built on the shoulders of the first series. And the principle goes like this, that if you want to live on mission, if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be changed to become like him, if you want to become, may have an impact in this world, if you want to carry out your purpose in life and achieve your destiny, there are times when you have to enter the danger. There are times when Jesus is going to say, follow me into the danger. If you want to live on mission, you have to enter the danger. Now you say, well, what kind of danger? I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> this is why I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you three examples, right? Three examples of kinds of danger that Jesus calls us to enter into. And we'll see all three kinds throughout this series. We see them today in the life of Stephen. We'll see them throughout the series. Uh, they all start with the letter P. So the first, the first P stands for persecution, right? This obvious one. If you're going to follow Jesus, you have to be willing to uh, enter the danger and be willing to be persecuted for him. Now, this is something Jesus said. He said that anyone who would take up, anyone who would follow me, in fact, it's on your note sheet, Luke 9. If anyone would follow me, that pretty much takes in all of us, anyone. So if anyone would follow me, you have to be willing to take up your cross. Remember, a cross was a, 
uh, uh, a symbol of uh, death, torture, right? It's, it's not like a gold shiny thing you wear on your neck. That'd be like having an electric chair around your neck today. Uh, it, it's like, no, it's, this is an emblem. This is a symbol of, of Roman oppression, brutality, torture. And so Jesus said, hey, if you're going to follow me, you have to be ready to die. You have to be ready to enter the danger. I'm, that's where I'm headed. If you're going to follow me, you have to go. And so we saw this in Luke 21. He said, when people arrest you and you're standing before, don't, don't worry, I'll be with you in it. I'll give you the words to say. And so we see this. And this is what we're going to see in, in this uh, section of Acts. You see, in the first series of Acts, what we saw is there were storm clouds of persecution on the horizon, weren't there? We watched as the leaders of the movement, Peter and John, were arrested, brought into custody, warned to not teach in Jesus' name, or if you do, bad things will happen. And they kept doing it, and then bad things happened. They were whipped. And so they went back to the early church, and they shared the threats of the early church. And you remember in chapter 4, the early church went before God. They didn't ask to be protected from the Satan, you know, Satan was to be persecuted. They said, give us boldness so we can continue to live life on mission and continue to share the message and continue to do miracles to validate what we're saying. And so, but at that point, when we ended our last session, all the persecution that had happened was that two leaders had been beaten, right? So you could see it coming. But can I tell you, with this event of Stephen this week and next, everything's going to change. This will be the match. This will be the spark, the lights of flame that's going to turn like into super combustion, like a raging forest fire overnight. And by the time we end with Stephen's story next week, there is going to be a major persecution unleashed against all believers in Jerusalem to the extent that these ten to 15,000 believers have to leave the San Fernando Valley and go to Bakersfield. Right? <laughs> they have got to run for their lives. So it's going to change. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to turn on a dime. What's going to be there as a potential storm cloud is going to break out in this huge hurricane of persecution. And it's all going to happen this week and next. It's all going to happen right here. Right? Now, this is what Jesus said. He said, if you're going to follow me, you have to be ready to enter the danger. Up to that point, these Christians in Jerusalem had been well received. They were well thought of. Luke had told us that they were people, uh, they, you know, looked at them with favor. That's the way the word he used. Right? It's all going to change. And this is why I think this series is so pertinent for us, this first P, why it's so pertinent for us as a church. Because I think we're in a very similar historical situation. We are here in America. We've been in a series uh, uh, over the life of our country where we've just enjoyed incredible freedoms, religious freedom, freedom of speech. And, you know, as you look back over our lifetimes, whether you have a short one or a brief, you know, long one, uh, if you look back over our lifetimes, I mean, there's been a lot of freedom for Christians to be Christians, and it's often been seen as a positive thing. Even if it, someone doesn't agree, they'll say, well, it's a good thing, or at least they're a good person, or, you know, something like that, right? And that's how it's been in our country. But times are changing, aren't they? And it is changing rapidly. And I really believe this, unless there's some major revival in our nation in the next few years, the price tag of following Jesus is about to go up, right? And so for us, we're in a very similar situation, that we love Jesus, and we've been saved, and we enjoy the community of his church, and we love what he's done in our life, and it's been a great thing, and, and all of a sudden, the price tag is about to go up. And what Jesus says, hey, if you're going to follow me and live life on mission, that you have to be willing to follow me into the day. Take up your cross, follow me. Okay? So we're going to see that in this series. Uh, number two, not number two, second P. Second P is the P of paradigms. Now, this is going to take a little bit more explanation, but not a lot. You'll, you'll catch it. But when it comes to our relationship with God, everyone has a paradigm of how the spiritual life works. I don't, I don't care, believer, non-believer, you're a Buddhist, you're an atheist, uh, you're Hindu, you're uh, you know, from Islam, whatever. We all have a paradigm, don't we? We all have a, a point of view. And you often see this, like when you're talking with someone about Jesus, that sometimes people will say, well, I can't believe in a God that would, Ooh, right? and what are they telling you? They have a paradigm of how God is and how God works and 
This is how it is. Or I can't believe that God would say that these two people shouldn't do this, you know. And it's a paradigm. And we all have it. We, everyone has it. Even if you're an atheist, you have a paradigm. There is no God, and that's your paradigm, and all this is a hogwash, and it's a waste of time, and it's evil or dangerous or whatever. So we all have a paradigm. So when it comes to spirituality, we all have a paradigm of who God is and how you have a relationship with God and, and how relationships should work and how we should live and how that God wants us. So we all have one. And here's the thing. When anyone threatens our paradigm, we tend to get very defensive. We tend to get very, uh, we, we tend to back off. We tend to get afraid. Sometimes that fear leads to attack. And that's what's going on here in Stephen's story, is that Stephen is threatening some of the core paradigms of Judaism of his day. Uh, the Jews of, of, of Stephen's day, especially in Jerusalem, I mean, the temple is a place where heaven meets earth. It is the most holy place of all creation. It's where creation itself started. It's where God lives. You, the temple is inviolable. To suggest that the temple would be torn down or destroyed is as much as saying God would be destroyed. You see, the temple is uh, holy. And any speaking of the temple, uh, the law of Moses is permanent. It's forever. If you want to have a relationship with God, you, you have it through the law of Moses. You honor the law of Moses. And there's no relationship with God outside of honoring the, God, the law. And so there's certain strong paradigms. Of this is what it means to be a Jew. A Jew is someone who worships the one true God according to the law of Moses who resides at Jerusalem. This is what it means. And all of a sudden, Stephen is beginning to challenge that paradigm. And so maybe their accusations weren't exactly accurate. They're trying to hang him out to dry on certain charges, and they're going to, they're going to exaggerate. But they're not that far from the truth, that the day of the temple is over. Jesus has said this. Remember a woman at the well? Hey, trust me, woman, a time is coming when true worshipers will not worship either here at Mount Gerizim or at Jerusalem. For God is spirit, and, he, and those who worship him will worship in spirit and truth. Remember the last week of Jesus' life, he looked down in the temple, and he said, trust me that every stone is going to be torn down. You see? The times are changing. Remember when Jesus had, had once said in Mark chapter 7, uh, and he said, it's not what goes in a man that make, defiles him, it's what comes out of a man, out of his heart. And, and so the, Mark had made that little comment, by this Jesus pronounced all food clean. Right? The, the times are changing with the coming of Jesus. Jesus said, a woman, believe me, a time is coming and is now here. Times are changing. And Stephen gets it more than the apostles. This is going to be fascinating. As we go through this, you know, we look back on the Bible as if it was delivered from God, you know, post office, boom, all together. There's a process even his leaders in the Bibles go through as they come through their understanding of the work of Jesus. You know, when we get in this series, we get to chapter 10, God is going to send Peter to speak, to share the gospel with, with Gentiles, Cornelius, and Peter is going to be blown away. The thought that a Gentile can be saved to Peter is unthinkable. And it's like, wait a second. You're with Jesus for three years, saw the resurrection. Um, he said, go into all the world, share with everybody. It's been several years. You've been doing miracles and teaching the church. You're still completely in the dark on this whole who salvation's for thing. And you're an apostle. In fact, you're the Pope. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, 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 are you with me in this? Yeah. And what we're going to watch is, we're going to watch is God, the Holy Spirit, mentors these early leaders. And he takes them and says, this is how you think it works. And they're wrong. And he is going to bring them along. And step by step, he's going to open their eyes to a fuller understanding of who Jesus is, why he came, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, and how we please him in our life. And we're going to watch it. And can I tell you something? Every time that God pushes on one of the paradigms, it's going to feel dangerous to them. 
It's going to feel scary to him. In fact, when the Holy Spirit comes and tells Peter to go with these three guys downstairs, and it turns out when he gets down there, they're Gentiles, and he would never even do that. Peter says, okay, I'll go, but he takes six Jewish brothers with him. We're now seven to three. You got you completely outnumbered, you Gentiles. And I don't know what's going on here. This is crazy. I'm going to meet with Gentiles. But whatever happens, I want seven men to be able to give a witness of what God does. Because this is feeling crazy to me. You see what's going on? And so Stephen is challenging their paradigm. It feels very scary to them. They're going to push back big time. But this is what we're going to watch. It's not just the non-believers. We're going to watch the Holy Spirit push back on the believer's paradigm. And with every step he takes them, guess what? They come into more freedom. Remember what Jesus said? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And what the Holy Spirit's going to do, he's going to take these believers who love Jesus, apostles, love Jesus, believe in Jesus, leading the church, but still in the dark, and he's going to take up on a scary route that's going to feel very scary, but every time they follow him into the danger, they're going to get more freedom and more impact, and the whole movement of Jesus is going to be changed. Now, here's what I want to catch. Here's what I want you to catch. This is exactly what happens in your life and my life when we come to Jesus. When we come to Jesus, we are just like these first believers, that we all have paradigms of how God works and what God is like and what it takes to have a relationship with God and how do you grow and how does, what does God expect of you. We all do. And some of those paradigms are right and good and true and lead to freedom in life. And some of them lead to bondage and death. The trick is we don't know which is which. Like if we knew which of our paradigms was wrong, we would change them. We don't know. And so part of our growth as a follower of Jesus is with the Holy Spirit take us back and re-educate us, free us up, take us back to the word that we thought we understood and say, hey, no, you didn't understand. You misunderstood that. And free us up. And in this process, can I tell you, whenever the Holy Spirit leads you that way, it will feel dangerous. Because deep in your heart, you're going to be afraid. You're leaving what you've always believed to be true. And whenever you leave what you've always believed to be true, it feels scary. What if I'm wrong? Let me give you some really practical examples. Some of you have grown up in very legalistic Christian backgrounds. And what I mean by legalistic is I don't mean you take the Bible seriously. That's what some people think. Uh, no sex before marriage. You're so legalistic. No, I'm just biblical. Right? Uh, it, legalistic means we add man-made rules to what God has said. We add to what the Bible says. That's legalism. Okay? And so some of you grew up in very legalistic homes. You were taught that sex is a bad thing. In your marriage, you still have a hard time enjoying sex. It's like what you were taught your whole life. This is an evil thing. It's a dirty thing. It's a, it's a wrong thing. That you were taught, well, Christians never are Christians always. And you've come to Jesus. Maybe you grew up in a church like that or came from a church like that. And you come to Rocky Peak and you start hearing something different. And you start like, wow, I really like this. But is it true? Is it really true that, that this thing I've been taught is not really even right? It's not even from God's word. Maybe you come from a, like a faith healing background. God never wants anyone to be sick. And so for the last 10, 20 years, you've believed that. Every time someone gets sick, you claim their healing in the name of Jesus. You command the demon to come out. And you come here and you start reading through the word about Paul being sick and his friends being sick and this guy almost dying. You're like, maybe we got that a little off, right? But it feels really scary to change, doesn't it? It feels... And, for those of you who have come from a legalistic background, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Then every time that you feel like the Holy Spirit's calling you out into something new, it feels like, oh, I don't know about this. But as you study the word, as the Spirit's pulling, it's like, yeah, this makes sense, right? And there's freedom. It leads to freedom. Remember what Paul says, the Spirit of the Lord brings liberty, right? Some, uh, some others of you are on the other opposite end. You've come to Jesus at a very liberal, very uh, kind of politically correct background. 
and you've come to Jesus, and you've given him your life, and you've experienced his life-giving salvation, but you sense the Holy Spirit calling you to some more conservative standpoints. It says, this is a path of life, trust me. There really are some things that matter in terms of sexuality. There are some things that matter in terms of right and wrong. All paths don't lead the same place. And you sense the Holy Spirit calling you, and you see it in the Word. But deep inside, it's so hard. For, this is the way you were raised. This is so part of your identity. These things are so deep in you. And you know that if you were to embrace some of these new standards that God is revealing, that it could cost you friendships. It could cost your family. You'll be ostracized if you do. And so the Holy Spirit says, this is the path to freedom. Follow me. And you're like, I don't know. This feels scary. It feels dangerous. Are you with me in this? Some of us have been raised in settings where there's been no distinction made in biblical teaching between what we call here at Rocky Peak primary teaching and secondary. There's certain things you have to believe to be a follower of Jesus, right? There's certain core things of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. There's certain core lifestyle behavior things that you cannot follow Jesus and, and embrace those things. And those are primary things. I mean, we never compromise. But we talk about this here at Rocky Peak. There's all kinds of other issues that Christians who love Jesus and love his word have disagreed on forever because this, the case is not as clear or they're not as important. Maybe it's uh, seven-day creationism. Maybe it's which version of the Bible is the best. Maybe it's spiritual gifts. Maybe it's women in leadership. Maybe it's whether Christians should celebrate Halloween. It could be a million things, right? Contemporary versus traditional worship. And we've never learned the difference between primary things and secondary. And so for us to let go of one thing feels like we're losing the whole thing. For us, it's like, hey, if I don't use the King James Bible, I'm going to hell. Right? And we laugh, but there's a lot of people that have been raised. The King James Bible is the only one. And, it, and here's 18 reasons why. And if you don't believe the King James Bible, it's like you're on a path to hell. And they've never learned to distinguish between the essential things and the secondary things. And so when God starts calling you to a place of freedom, that feels scary. Are, are you with me in this? This is scary. But here's what I want you to do. We're going to watch in this series as time after time, the Holy Spirit is going to speak and lead these people that have strong paradigms about who God is and, and how God works, that he's going to lead people step by step out of that into a new place and say, you have misunderstood Scripture. And it's going to lead to new freedom and new power and new purpose. The, the most obvious example is the Apostle Paul. So who's Saul of Tarsus, who's hating and beating Christians, who's going to go through a major paradigm shift. And it's going to change his life forever. And you, you tell me, that's not scary? You, when you're standing there and you're seeing the Shekinah glory of God, and you say, who are you? And you go, I'm Jesus, the guy you've been beating? Into the danger, Right? And so some of you, God is going to call you into the danger. It's not going to be the danger of persecution. It's going to be the danger of a paradigm shift. And it's going to lead you to freedom, but it's going to feel scary. The third P stands for purpose. And I, I love this one. Um, we talked earlier about this path that Stephen was on. You know, Stephen uh, as comes to Christ, goes through a major paradigm shift. Jesus is Messiah. And then he's pursuing God fully, full of the Holy Spirit, trusting in Jesus. Jesus, you can do whatever you want. And he says, okay, the next step of your growth is to step into leadership. And so, and so he steps into leadership, and he becomes one of the seven overseeing this important ministry. But then the Holy Spirit is stirring in his heart. There is something more. You've been created for something more. I've got more for you. You follow me at this point. And so the Holy Spirit begins leading him to begin teaching and preaching and doing apologetic work in the synagogues and laying his hands on sick people and healing them. But it's scary because to take this step is a dangerous step. As long as he's taking care of the widows, his life is safe. The moment he goes in the synagogue and starts going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the, these leaders of the synagogue of the freedmen, you can feel the tension mounting. His life is now in danger. And you know, that's where Jesus is calling him. And here's the thing. For you to carry out God's purpose in your life, 
There are many times, not just one or two, there are many times in your life where Jesus will say, follow me into the danger. And catch this, if you're going to carry out God's purpose for your life, you have to say yes and follow him. And sometimes those will be just a simple step of obedience. You know, some of you right now, you may be in a relationship, you're dating with someone, and it's going nowhere. They're not a follower of Jesus. You know you shouldn't be in that relationship. And Jesus is saying, you need to trust me for your future, and you need to get out of this relationship. And it's scary to you. Well, what if I don't meet someone else? What if this is as good as it gets? What if I end up alone? And Jesus says, I've got a purpose for your life. But to achieve it, you have to follow me into the danger. The alternative is you're going to waste years in this relationship. It's going nowhere. It's going to end poorly. And you never get those years back. For some of us, we're in a relationship right now that new boundaries need to be set. Some of you are in a, a relationship where there's a conversation that needs to happen and you've known it and Jesus has been encouraging you and you've not been having that conversation. For some of you, during this series, he's going to call you into a new ministry or to step up in a new ministry. You know, in the fall, we talked about this. I just gave these three quick examples, not that they're the end all of end all, but just from Rocky Peak. Remember the, uh, the sex hours who left their uh, corporate job in America to, to launch this ministry in India, no background, no training. Remember Karen Wynn, who uh, uh, launched this ministry called Into Focus to take eye care to third world countries and share the gospel. We talked about um, Steve Gers and his team launching the Himalayan Joy Home. Remember those things? These were all like out of left field for them. Let me ask you, do you think the sex hours felt any risk when they left their cush job in corporate America? to say, we'll start taking this other career. To be, do you think that Karen ever felt any risk? Do you think that Steve ever felt like, will this ever even work? Yeah, of course. You see, if you want to play the game, you have to get in the game. It's chips in. You know, we're all in. Right? We, you know, if you're going to place a bet, put some money on it. Like, if you think Jesus is, is who he claims to be, and if he's calling you, then be full of faith. Step in. Follow. Who knows what he wants to do, what the purpose is. We watch Stephen go from fully passionate Christ follower to leader of the church to apologist. And now he's going to be speaking before the highest court of the land and giving the most full explanation of the message of Jesus in a public setting that's been given in the history of the church. We're going to watch it. We're going to watch him fulfill his destiny for his life, his God-ordained destiny. But it happened because every step of the way, he said yes, and the last step required some danger. And so for some of you, God is going to be calling you through this series to take the step. Lead that life group. Step into that position. You say, but I'm afraid I will fail. That's what faith is all about. Without a fear of failure, there is no faith required. Faith and failure go together. Hey, we walk by faith. We just not into failure. Hey, let me tell you something. If you can't fail, you don't need faith. Right? Faith and risk go hand in hand. Like you don't set the nation of Israel free unless you leave the sheep and go face Pharaoh. The Jordan River doesn't stop until the priests put their feet in. The wall of Jerusalem doesn't get rebuilt until Nehemiah resigns his cushy job. See, things happen when we step into the gap. Things happen when we step into the danger, and God cannot carry out his purpose in your life if you're not willing to take the step. But when you do, things happen. There on your note sheet, I love what Oswald Chambers, I think he's one of my spiritual mentors, <laughs> and from his book, Studies on the Sermon on the Mount, <coughs> says, if a man is going to do anything worthwhile, and I think he would agree it's a woman too, but he wrote so long ago, they just wrote like that. If a man is going to do anything worthwhile, there are times when he has to risk everything on a leap. And the spiritual world, 
Jesus Christ demands that we risk everything we hold by our common sense and we leap into what he says. Immediately we do, we find that what he says fits on as solidly as our common sense. There's once you take the leap, things start to make sense. Have you noticed that? That after we say yes to Jesus and we take the step of obedience, we look back and we say, what took us so long? Because like Peter stepping out, the water's firm when you get there. You see? But you don't find out as long as you stay on the boat. You see, if you want to meet Jesus, you meet him in the storm. <laughs> if you want to experience Jesus, you have to get out of the boat. Because Jesus is not in the boat, he's out in the waves. Okay? So if you want to go where he's going, you want to experience him, that's where you meet him. And so this leads into number two. And number two will go very quickly, but it's so important. It's the second half of this principle, is that God will meet us in the danger. This is where God meets his people in the danger. You know, it's, it's when Abraham leaves that he, that he receives the promise of his son. It's, it's when Noah builds the ark that the rain eventually comes. It's, it, it God meets us as we step in. We see it throughout Acts. We see it today in Stephen. You know, as Stephen steps into the danger, God gives him the boldness, doesn't he? He steps in the danger. God gives them the wisdom they can't refute. And you catch this while everyone else is getting hot under the collar. Stephen's just sitting there with the face of an angel. And we're going to see it next week. You know why? Because he senses the presence of Jesus with him. We'll see it next week. You see, it's in the danger. And again, it's not stupid danger, right? I always feel I need to say this because someone's going to do something stupid and blame it on me. Uh, I'm not talking about risk for risk's sake. I'm talking about following Jesus when he calls you, right? That that's the kind of danger he calls us into. Dallas Willard says, it's absolutely essential to the nature of our personal development toward maturity when we grow as Christ's followers that we venture to be placed at risk for only risk produces character. Wow. You want to grow and be like Jesus? You want to carry out your life purpose? Listen and follow. And it will often scare you to death. But as you do, he will meet you. He'll transform you. He'll use you. And it's there you'll have your greatest impact. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. God, we're just uh, excited to be starting this series and to see where you lead us. And Lord, you have not said it'd be easy. You have not said... It's going to be today. You said, if anyone would follow me, pick up his cross. Uh, that we need to, to gird up, like King James says, gird up our loins. That we need to be ready to run. And Lord, we're excited for this series and what you're going to teach us. God, there are paradigms that need to be broken. There are stands that need to be taken. There are steps we need to follow. And as we do, we know you will meet us and change us and empower us. And then use us for the purpose for which we were created. And so, God, we pray you make it clear what those steps are, and that as a church and as a people and as individuals, we would follow you out of the boat, onto the water, into the ocean, and there you would meet us. And we pray that as we bring our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, God, use them to turn this place into a life-giving center of the message of Jesus. Hands and feet reaching out, sharing Christ in a way that transforms lives. We pray this in your name. Amen.